giving a, um, uh, my talk uh, about uh, GeoSpark. So um, I'm really excited about here, uh, about being here in Apache Khan. So a little bit of introduction about myself. My name is uh, Mohamed Sarwat. Uh, I'm uh, a professor of computer science, assistant professor of computer science at uh, Arizona State University. Um, I'm um, a little bit about my background. So I got uh, my PhD from University of Minnesota and my thing is basically in the uh, area of uh, data systems. Uh, so my work is basically bridging the gap between the geospatial and uh, the data systems community. So I've, uh, I built systems and I publish work in uh, both communities. These are example of just uh, uh, computer science technical community that I'm a member of. And uh, that's uh, the reason I chose that actually this kind of area is that uh, it it leads to the fact that my research is quite interdisciplinary and this is a great thing. Um, so that's, uh, th that's, that's about myself. So uh, before I go ahead and uh, talk about the um, uh, GeoSpark, I want, and some of you actually have pointed this out, but I want to talk about the concept of the uh, spatial data deluge. Uh, so, uh, spatial, the, the spatial analysis or the spatial data community has been there for decades. We have uh, a lot of really, really interesting systems, a lot of really smart people working in this field. Uh, however, in the last, I would say, decade or last 15 years, we have shifted uh, due to a lot of events. So we, uh, there have been a lot more interest in the geospatial work and there are reasons behind that. And this is what I wanna talk about when I talk about the spatial data deluge. So uh, recently we've been uh, witnessing a lot of uh, events that showed how our community is actually really, really important. And uh, it has shown also uh, that spatial data analysis is, is really crucial to a lot of really, uh, not just, uh, it's not like a lug, it's not a luxury to have, uh, to do spatial data analysis, it's actually quite necessary. And see here in the, in the slides, I'm just taking screenshots of some of the news recently about related to COVID-19 and uh, the US economy shut down. We've seen some talks about how people can analyze satellite imagery to understand how the shutdown affected the economy and the traffic in general. So this is actually uh, a quite interesting uh, time we're living in for uh, spatial data, for the use of spatial data analysis. But I would say uh, this creates, again, these applications create data but as also mentioned, I believe yesterday in one of the talks, the data may not be uh, as big. It, it, it's big data, but it's not too big in a sense. What created the spatial data deluge, deluge is actually more about, and it was a turning point for our community, is basically the invention of uh, the apps. So that was basically uh, back in 2008, when, uh, when like again, the iPhone started to have apps and this actually announcement from Apple, it, it, it was a great thing because almost every single app we have, this phone you move around with and it has GPS device, it has a location device uh, and every, every app sort of provide a location-based service. So it sends the location and start to do things based, on, based upon this location. And that's the idea, the very idea of this uh, of the app and again the location technology in phones is that what created the spatial data deluge. Now apps generates tons of geospatial data. So and these are just examples, right? So uh, like Uber used to generate a lot of data and uh, Mobike, which is a bike sharing company in China, generates tons of data per day. And this data is obviously uh, spatial it's spatial temporal, it's mobility, so it's generally geospatial data. 
and it's a lot of data that needs to be uh, analyzed and to extract some value from some of these companies or even cities and governments can can use this uh, data to extract value from so this is this is what i mean by spatial data deluge and this is what created even created our field uh, all of us actually attending here now in our field it made it uh, more interesting and more needed in the last uh, decade or so and it's still and it, it, it will keep growing even so the problem with this uh, like with this kind of data is that yes, uh, people back in the time when we like 30 years ago or 20 years ago, uh, when we had geospatial software or geospatial systems, uh, it, these were good tools because we have uh, very small data. So people were working, for example, with shape files, working with um, generally very, very small city and uh, country data or something like this. So it was, the problem that we have tons of data and a lot of people are talking about data is the new oil and we can extract a lot of value from data, but the systems that existed, uh, the classic systems, the traditional systems, uh, were not up to speed with uh, the spatial data deluge. So the question was how to process such data. So to process such data, um, like back then, like, uh, we asked this question, I was like, let's say in 2013, 2014, uh, back then, this, a lot of people were, uh, big data was a big deal and it still is, but a lot of people were interested in uh, Apache Hadoop, uh, which is a great tool. However, it came with a lot of uh, uh, shortcomings. Uh, and what happened is that Apache Spark started, was in, the, in its early stage, but Apache Spark was uh, based on our assessment in, in our group. We, uh, we thought that uh, from a standpoint of uh, scalability, from a standpoint of more interactivity and faster processing of the data, still in a very large cluster, we thought that would be uh, the choice. So we took, we took Apache Spark, it was not, back then it was still in early stages and we looked at it and we said, okay, can we process geospatial data at scale, that kind of huge spatial data with Apache Spark. So we looked at Apache Spark. We asked this question of can we process your spatial data with Apache Spark? We realized that Apache Spark did not provide a geospatial data processing API. So out of the box, you download Apache Spark, you try to set up a cluster. We did not provide a geospatial data processing API. The problem is that geospatial data uh, was treated. So when you talk to, well, like, if you talk to people that are not in the geospatial domain and ask them, okay, well, there is no API to provide geospatial data. A lot of people say that's that's okay. You can just treat the geospatial attribute as yet another attribute of the data, and things will be fine. It will work. Yes, it will theoretically work, uh, but the, the idea is that to do that, you need to write. Uh, thousands of lines of code to implement just simple spatial operations, something like spatial join, or even define uh, different spatial object types and all that kind of stuff. So that, that is a problem. Uh, another thing if treating geospatial data is yet another attribute, let's assume that, uh, and again, a lot of companies and a lot of uh, scientists, they're very smart people. They will say, no, I don't want, yes, I can write these thousand lines of code. I don't like, I don't mind doing that. That's okay, but who would guarantee that all the code that you wrote is optimized? So that's that's another problem is that yes, you can write all that sort of code to process geospatial data in, on top of Spark, but is this code optimized? And what I mean by optimized here is it, um, like for example, is it fast enough? Is it efficient enough for, in, for instance, do I, use the resources of the cluster. Let's assume I'm going to run this in the cloud in Amazon AWS or in Microsoft Azure, whatever it is. Do I use the resources of like the resources I have wisely or I, I just like instead of something that can be done with five machines, I do it in 50 machines. Yes, you're going to get the same result eventually, but the cost is going to be huge. The cost of operations are going to be huge. 
So cost of operation, cost of maintenance, optimization, the speed of the data science pipeline. If you're running data science or tasks, you want to make sure that you do things fast. So that, that was that was a challenge. So that's, uh, we ask uh, ourselves these questions. And again, we could not efficiently optimize use spatial queries out of the box again with Apache Spark, with the bare metal Apache Spark. So no spatial proximity aware load balancing, no spatial indices, no data, spatial data compression techniques. So what we did is that we looked at these and we took it as a challenge and we said, okay, we're gonna take Apache Spark and we're gonna kind of shake the system and build with it a geospatial data processing system that is again, scalable, uh, fast and cost efficient. So that was uh, the motivation and hence came uh, GeoSpark. So GeoSpark again is a data processing system. It's a geospatial, geospatial data. Um, what we did here on the surface, GeoSpark uh, reads input, input various uh, geospatial data formats. So you can eat, like, for example, shapefile, geojson documents. You can even read uh, CSV. You can read so many of the data formats, or even like PostGIS from the database or something like this, or Oracle Spatial. So you can read any of the spatial data formats loaded into GeoSpark. And on top, the data scientist or the user of the system can write geospatial data processing task on this data. And after you do this, GeoSpark will automatically, again, do the load balancing, will automatically uh, take care of the how the cluster is set up uh, to process the data processing for you. So this is, uh, this is basically the, uh, the general idea behind uh, GeoSpark. And again, uh, these data formats that we support, this is, these are just examples. There are so many other data formats and also GeoSpark is designed so that you can even extend the, the, the data kind of module of it to load data of different formats as well. If you come up tomorrow with a new format or a new standard for geospatial data. So there are several APIs when it comes to uh, GeoSpark. Uh, one of the most popular API is the, the SQL API. So SQL is, a, is like, as a language, is very popular. Most data scientists and data engineers are familiar with SQL uh, when it comes to processing the data. So in GeoSpark, we also provide support for uh, uh, SQL, and we implemented most of the, uh, SQL, the SQL functions in the either uh, the OGC standard or the uh, MM3 standard, like several standards when it comes to geospatial data. An example of these standards is the OGC standard. So the idea is that the same way you used to run SQL, the same way you used to run SQL in, for example, PostGIS or Oracle Spatial or any of the existing spatial databases, you can run also SQL, like you can write the same SQL in GeoSpark. Uh, which makes it easy to use as well, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. We want to use the same API so that the data can entertain the scalability, again, and all the features that we talked about, and still use the same uh, language that they're used to. Uh, so the architecture, uh, there are other APIs, right, I'm going to talk about later, but let's focus now uh, on the SQL API. So GeoSpark basically basically, uh, it looks like that, so it extends the uh, extends the uh, RDD uh, face of Apache Spark with something called and build new things on top of it called the spatial resilient distributed data set, a spatial RDD. So spatial RDD is also an immutable object and it's distributed across the cluster, partitioned, and uh, all these objects are also load balanced. So you can load points, you can load polygons, rectangle RDDs from the data that is loaded from the files or from the database, right? Different types of uh, spatial uh, and geometrical uh, objects you can represent in the spatial RDD. Uh, the good thing about this is that it can be automatically 
partition based on the spatial proximity, the geospatial proximity. It can be also uh, indexed using spatial indices and also it supports geometrical transformation actions on these uh, kind of spatial objects. So, <clears throat> so this is basically the idea of the spatial RDD. On top of the spatial RDD, there are also like a spatial query processing layer. So this is basically the layer when you run uh, traditional spatial queries. Again, if you have a really spatial range operator, if you have a spatial KNN uh, operation, and so on and so forth, and we're spatial join. It, th these operations, even though they're similar to database operations we're used to, or data processing operations we're used to, in, like, for example, suppose GIS or Oracle Spatial or any existing database systems, but the way they're implemented, they're implemented using the, R, the spatial RDD API, which is written in Scala and Java. And then on top of it, even, there is, your, there is the spatial query optimizer. So the query optimizer would basically decide which way is the best way to process uh, the spatial uh, the, the query that you write or the data processing operation that you write in the uh, Spark cluster. So there are there is an optimization uh, module inside that will decide that figure out what what is the best way. Best way means again the way that will minimize the cost to running things in the cluster while at the same time uh, achieving the highest parallelism possible and also reducing the latency when it comes to the application running on top. So uh, spatial RD, uh, the, the, the good thing about like in the spatial RDD is very optimized for geospatial data in a sense that it, it has a spatial compression technique that compresses data uh, so that when you have a object, uh, either when you store it in memory in one of the machines in the cluster or you move it around during data transfer because of the data processing you have. It's very optimized, it's very compact, so that reduces the cost, uh, the network cost, and even the memory cost of the cluster as well. So this is a one, one, uh, one good thing about uh, spatial RDDs. Uh, also the automatic partitioning. So the automatic partitioning is another uh, great thing about spatial RDDs. Um, so uh, the idea here is that we automatic, like uh, we implemented state-of-the-art or de facto spatial partitioning technique and the user, the data scientist can entertain any of these. Uh, so we implemented uniform grid, for example, KD trees, quad trees, R trees, uh, partitioning method. And the idea is to achieve load balancing when you run whatever kind of data processing task on top of this. Um, we have another, uh, like we have like some kind of an autopilot kind of uh, feature also inside uh, GeoSpark in, in a sense that the insta instead of the data scientist using uh, the uh, choosing the partitioning technique, it can automatically be chosen uh, based on the distribution of the data. Um, also, there are indexing. We have the global index. We have the local index. Uh, the global index is basically decided, is designed to do partition elimination to not using things within, uh, not using things, uh, not using closed like machines that are not involved in the processing. We have also uh, local uh, indexing and the local indexing basically is to kind of minimize the, reduce the amount of computation uh, on each machine. And also this will speed up the computation because if you reduce the amount of computation on each machine to do the spatial data processing, that will be a very uh, that will also reduce the time to find uh, to finish the query. No. So back to this figure. This is just the one view of the architecture. On top of the uh, RDD, there are different join up. We implemented various query processing operations. So the uh, query processing uh, operations. I'm not gonna obviously. I'm not explain how each one of them is implemented. An example of them is the spatial join operator. We have different implementation of the spatial join. Uh, this is just in this slide showing just one of the implementation that dips the partitions and do join and then remove duplicates. Uh, the idea is if you're using two data sets and join them together and they are co-partition based on the spatial proximity of objects. Uh, there are various implementations, however, uh, the query optimizer, so um, the query optimizer on top 
decide which spatial join algorithm to use or which um, plan in general to use in order to process the various tasks. You've got about 10 minutes left and we've got- oh, So you write, uh, there are like, we, we extend the Apache Spark Catalyst to support spatial expressions, heuristic rules and RDD statistics. And then uh, there is also uh, cost-based spatial optimizations that are also embedded in the Apache Spark Catalyst and using this kind of cost-based optimizer, we decide which way to choose, which plan to choose. Again, as you, you see here, there are two different plans down to run the, um, uh, this spatial join operation. Them use the range join, another one the broadcast join. Some of them may be better than the other in certain situations. So the idea here is to, for the query optimizer to choose the best. And again, the ultimate goal is essentially whatever you have a data processing task, spatial join is just one line that you write in your entire spatial data science task. So you want this, uh, this query to be as optimized as possible so that you don't solve the data science pipeline. Uh, these are just numbers based on commodity machines we have in the lab. Again, we're an academic group, so uh, you can definitely uh, process, like, if you have more powerful machines, you can even do the spatial join in, in, in a way more efficient, uh, way faster. So um, this this was just an introduction about GeoSpark. Uh, just an announcement today, some of you may already know, so uh, GeoSpark started as an academic project at Arizona State University. Uh, so the team uh, recently, uh, GeoSpark has been accepted as uh, an Apache uh, project in the incubator pro program, and it has been renamed to Apache Sedona. So, uh, so when I say GeoSpark and Apache Sedona is the same exact thing, however, we're gonna move from now on, we're gonna say just Apache Sedona. So, uh, so this is just, these are the uh, information about Apache Sedona. That is, uh, if, you, if you want to learn more about the features, visit the website, also there is the GitHub link. Uh, there's a lot of activity. A lot of people are using the system, which obviously is something that we're really excited about. And also there is, if you want to follow the news, there is the Twitter handle for the Apache Sedona system. Um, so, um, So can you see, or, um, so what we have here is, you can see here, so we have Apache Sedona, you can, again, read all these different formats, and on top of it, there are a lot of sub-projects that we have been working on. So there is, uh, there is a Python API, because we realize not everybody wants to use SQL, or, so we have a wrapper, a Python wrapper. So if you if you want to use, for example, uh, Apache Sedona with a GeoPandas or something like this, you can use the Python wrapper that we have. There's also an R wrapper that is that there is it, it's released, but it's been also still being tested uh, for uh, to, to integrate uh, your R applications with Apache Sedona. We're trying to implement also temporal capability beside the geospatial capability. You can implement that now, but it's not fully optimized the temporal aspect within trajectories and mobility also uh, in spatial temporal data. This is also something that we, we want to do. And we want to also focus uh, on spatial streaming in the future. So some of these things, the Python R simulation, they exist. Uh, some of them, they're future projects that we will be working on to extend Apache Sedona for the community to use more stuff. Uh, we're also uh, planning to invent of the Apache uh, Sedona Summit uh, event, so it's coming soon. Uh, please stay, t uh, yeah, stay tuned uh, for that. Uh, so next steps. So I uh, like be before I end, I wanna I wanna open the floor for discussion. But uh, and uh, the next steps that we want to follow is basically the bigger goal is to enable spatial data science at scale. So what do I mean by this? What do you mean by spatial data science? So I'm uh, quoting, uh, quoting uh, Luke Enslin uh, from the University of Chicago, defines spatial data science. Uh, it treats location, distance, and spatial interaction as core aspects 
uh, of the data and employ specialized method and software to store, retrieve, explore, analyze, visualize, and learn from such data. So the idea here is like, how can you do that with the spatial data deluge that we're talking about? So uh, there, there have been already so many tools to support geospatial data. They're either specialized geospatial tools or some of them are um, just diff general purpose data processing tools. From uh, the slide is just giving a general idea of how it's data science uh, application or pipeline works. So you have a data system in the back end that can be PostGIS, Oracle Spatial, uh, and you have a data science tool. And data science tool can be R, Tableau, Esri, QGIS, that you can use to perform some data science tasks, or even a machine learning library that works here. Uh, like, So you have the data scientist issue the analysis, and then from the analysis, you like this analysis sent to the data science tool. The data science tool uses a query. Yeah, James, I cannot hear you, but I can see the the chat. I will just finish in a minute here. There is a query, and the query go to the data system, get the data, and then this is the data processing and preparation task. And then you send the data data science tool. And the results are again an analysis result is presented to the user, and this is actually goes in. Um, there's a lot of iterations that you go. It's like okay, data scientist access data science tool, get the data, and then run the analytics task, the data science task, and then present the result to the user at the end. And again, iterative process you can run so many iterations to come up with the insights that you need. The problem is that the data retrieval process extremely slow if the data is too large and the data is large. Uh, so how we solve this, we like, again, Apache Sedona can help you solve this problem here a little bit. So uh, Apache Sedona helped you with this. However, even if you scale the query processing right fast, the result of the processing when the data is prepared, the result's still so big. So when you try to, for example, show things in Esri or, uh, for example, show, build a map in Tableau on this huge result, it will, these kind of tools, uh, like, for example, Tableau, when you run this, it will crash. If you want to visualize a map on massive scale data, it will crash. So how can we solve this interactivity problem here? So that's another challenge. And an example of this is here with Tableau, is that you need to make sure that this whole kind of visualization is very interactive, even with large scale query resulted from the data system. So this is one thing that, uh, that we are also working on. How can we do the science to make this work in a more interactive way? So, um, so again, uh, I will leave you with this. And I'm ready to take more questions. So shall I take the questions in the uh... Mo, can you hear me? It's George. Now he looks muted. <laughs> It's best to do as much as you can in chat for the next few minutes, Jim. So is Spark support 3. Point, is Spark 3.x be supported soon? Yes. Um, how does it compare to Magellan? Uh, there, are, there are a few comparisons with several papers, not by us, by also third party, that shows that, for example, uh, we compared with Magellan, uh, we can achieve, we can be uh, fast, and we can also have, there's more comprehensive uh, geospatial data operations that we can support. Uh, this is compared to Magellan. And on the Sedona website, you will see some comparisons with other systems as well. 
uh, do you plan to support 3D? Yes, we plan to support 3D. We're talking to some uh, people now to, we're trying to load point clouds, also data into the system. Currently in the current version, we don't, but we're exploring all of this. Uh, so uh, GeoMesa also provides a spatial extension to uh, a spatial extension to Spark. Uh, yes, we're familiar with GeoMesa, uh, and there are some spatial extensions to Spark and GeoMesa, but there are some spatial extensions to a lot of things in GeoMesa as well. Uh, we are uh, we are uh, like again we focused on Spark and we actually kind of squeeze the performance as much as we can so that we can achieve all these kind of things. Uh, can there be collaboration? We would love to collaborate with uh, GeoMesa uh, developers for sure. And I believe there are some kind of talks, uh, especially when it comes to the common things we use. Um, so I'm looking at other questions, Rio. So the planning for Sedona to handle raster data. Yes, that's also another thing uh, in, in the planning. Okay, so, right, can you read it? Okay. All right, so there interoperability, interoperability between Sedona and, between Sedona and things like GeoTrellis, Raster Frames, and GeoMesa. Uh, there are things that we do similar, uh, similarly uh, there are things that we also all like, uh, like we follow standards when it comes to geospatial data formats. Uh, so if these systems follow the same standards, that they, they can be interoperable. Uh, there are things that are that we implement, like that are implemented in several systems that are actually, uh, I would say, redundant. Uh, we realize that, right? Because either, and I'll say it was done by. Um, uh, with a good intent, like people, like some people didn't know about GeoSpark when it started a long time ago. Maybe GeoSpark didn't get a lot of traction earlier. Uh, maybe we didn't know initially about GeoMesa when we started GeoSpark. So we started this actually back in time, like years, years ago. So, but I believe uh, interoperability would be a great thing to achieve between these systems. All right. So I think I've, uh, yes. I think I've covered everything. And did we go over time or we're good? Awesome. So we didn't go over time. Thank you so much, guys. Please, please uh, use Apache Sedona and tell us if there are any issues. And if we're going to be, we're going to release, uh, we're going to announce the Sedona uh, Summit event soon. So please do that as well. And also, uh, at the event, you can even like kind of uh, uh, criticize the system and say what you don't like about it. We like that. That will make us better. Thank you so much, guys.